Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for episode 85 of the show. I'm your host, Louise H. Reed, with listeners in over 145 countries and millions of iTunes downloads and ongoing podcasts. I'm here each week to talk life and leadership with ordinary people living extraordinary lives. People who are examples of taking brave, bold action in pursuit of their dreams and goals and are here to share their journey to help you do the same in yours. I say it every week that there is nothing more valuable than time. And so as a way of saying thank you to all of you for listening each week, I love to give prizes away. Each month I have a draw for exclusive Lady Boss loyalty swag. So to get your hands on some of this, simply comment on a podcast episode with the hashtag Lady Boss Loyalty, and you are automatically entered into the draw. My listeners who listen every week know I'm a little bit behind, so don't you worry, there will be several winners this next time my new stuff arrives. So please, I love hearing from all of you. Please comment away and continue to please be the fuel that allows me to show up bright and shiny and sharing every week. Now, without further ado, let me introduce you to today's guest. And ack, I'm totally going to expose myself right out of the gates. We have a beautiful Wendy with a last name I forgot to ask how I pronounce. Wendy is going to tell us in a few minutes how to pronounce her wonderful last name. So Wendy, let me tell you about her, is an educator, writer, and author of the Pika Bunny book series. Holding a bachelor's degree in education from the University of Tennessee, Wendy has created an innovative learning series that teaches understanding and kindness. Her stories, Pika Bunny and the Thunderstorm, Pika Bunny has a big question, and Pika Bunny says, eep, feature life lessons children often face in a complicated world and presents tools to help them navigate such complexities with bravery, understanding, and kindness. Her books have been recommended by therapists, counselors, activists, and teachers alike, and are a yearly feature at the New York City Book Expo America and Book Con. Wendy has devoted her career, spanning over 20 years, to helping children. A former dance teacher, she has specialized in supporting creative expression. As a math tutor, she has a unique ability of relating to children in a way that promotes excellence. I could go on and on, but I won't. You are here to hear from Wendy. So let me please introduce and welcome Wendy to the show. Thank you so much, Louise. Thank you for having me. And I'm, I apologize for that extraordinary long bio. I'll work on that. <laughs> it wasn't. It's perfect. <laughs> but it is hard to hear all of that in one go, isn't it? Yeah, it's like, she's a what? <laughs> I was like, what, what does that say? <laughs> <laughs> she's talking about me? Yeah. That woman Ooh. sounds pretty awesome. <laughs> Right? Right. 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 And so, Wendy, I apologize. Please uh, share with us your last name. Oh, sure. It's Gil Hula. Gil like part of a fish and Hula like the dance. Gil Hula. I like that. That's a fun last name. Gil Hula. My, my Here we have... Oh, go ahead. No, it's oh, okay. Here we my have Wendy Gil Hula. And what were you going to tell us about your husband? Well, he's Canadian. And I met him in Knoxville, Tennessee, and he told me his last name. And I had never heard that before. So I was like, that's not really a last name. I was just teasing him. <laughs> and, he, and it was so long ago, he showed me in the phone book. He's like, yeah, here it is in the phone book. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was so funny. And here I am, I get to have it for life. So I'm very excited. You do, <laughs> you do. And so I, uh, I we, we were connected on LinkedIn. I often like to reflect on how it is that I have come to connect with the amazing people, many women, as you know, I love to have, particularly have women on this show. And we connected on LinkedIn. And, oh, and you, actually, I think you had sent me a couple of emails. You had been brave, and you had sent me a couple of emails. I'm like, I like this woman's grit and spunk. Let me check <laughs> her out. And there were numerous things that attracted me to you, one of them being really the, what, what is behind your, your stories and, and your mission is really about kindness. And so I'd love to hear a little bit about how did you get – into this aspect, like, how did you come to be focusing on, 
on kindness, bravery, understanding. And maybe you have to rewind the clock, start wherever makes sense for you. Okay, well, I'm gonna start with when I started with my first manuscript. And that was um, over two decades ago. And I wrote, Pika Bunny has a big question, but it, it, it was under a different title. And I sent it to a publisher and it got rejected because the publisher told me that kindness was not relevant. And I was humiliated, I was embarrassed. I thought, oh, how, you know, I wrote something that's irrelevant. I mean, how, it doesn't get worse than that. So I, this is the time where I had typed it up. I only had one copy and I stashed it away in a drawer. And then every time I cleaned out my dresser drawers, it would throw it away. I would literally put it in the trash can and it would get all crumpled up in there and I would finish reorganizing and then I would look at that trash can several, you know, several times. And I thought, well, I, I don't think that my words are trash. And it was this, the story that I wanted to tell my children who weren't even in this world yet. And it was about different ways to be kind. And it didn't even occur to me to bring them back out again until 2014 when one of my math students asked me a very innocent question. He just said, asked me, you know, what do you do all day before you tutor? And he was just asking to get to know me better. And in my head, I said, I write books that kids are never going to read. And then on the outside, I said, you never know what Mrs. Gilhul is doing. And then for a few days, it bothered me that my inner dialogue was not something that I wanted. And when I tutor and mentor these kids, I'm always trying to help them become the best they can be and figure out what their likes are and so they can follow their own dreams. And I realized that I wasn't following my own dreams. I wasn't having courage to do that for myself. And I thought, well, how can I be an example? How can I be a, a mentor? How can I be a parent? Because I do have two children who aren't, who isn't following their own advice. So I brushed off the manuscript I edited it a few more times and then I started sending it off to agents and publishers and I found a publisher and let's see that got um, my first book got published in 2017 and here we are wow I I had a bit of a, a lump in my throat as I heard your story it's quite poignant um, you know a few things I was making note of the first being kindness isn't relevant. Wow. Um, how, what, I want to explore all, all parts of your story that you shared, but how do you think it's, I think kindness has always been relevant, let's be honest, but what is it about what's happening now or why do you think it was accepted now? Is there a time, is it in place for kindness that hasn't been there before? Or what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that back when I sent it off, we still had Mr. Rogers and he was already promoting the kindness and listening and, and acceptance of kids and for themselves and being courageous for themselves. So I think that there wasn't really a hole like there is today. I, I feel like today it's a struggle to be kind, not that people or some people do choose to be unkind because they don't feel good inside or, you know, it's, or it comes out. And I think a lot of people's buckets aren't very full right now. And kindness has become a struggle. It's, I want to be kind to somebody, but what if they get mad at me? Or I want to be kind to somebody. Am I going to be seen as weak? Yeah. Do you wow. <sighs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I do, it's hard to hear and accept that that can be true, but you live in, you know, I've, I've, I've got four kids and certainly um, see aspects of that. You certainly see more children based on the work that you do. Um, but I love that comment about Mr. Rogers. If you're listening and you're too young to know Mr. Rogers, Google him. <laughs> 
Um, and I hadn't really thought of it like that, that for children, he was, he was it, wasn't he? For many, many years being on TV, he was the, the kindness guru. <laughs> he was the teacher of kindness. Uh, and with that missing now, with him missing now, it creates that hole. So I'd love to, I'm sure we'll jump into this a little bit more because I certainly would like to talk a little bit about that and education and how your books can support both parents and educators. But, but I'd like, before we go there, I'd like to hear a little bit more about your story in terms of, so you dusted off the manuscript based on what this student had asked you in terms of what you do um, during the day or while you waited for your, for your tutoring kids after school. There's one thing to feel those feelings of, oh, I really, you know, I need to do something with this and then taking action. Why and how? Why take action then and how did you actually get over that inner critic to take the action to move forward? Well, you know, I figured the publisher I sent it to so many years ago, they don't remember me. And this was these were secret manuscripts that nobody, my husband didn't know about it, my kids didn't know about it. So I thought, well, if I brush it off, I edit it, I try again, then I, you know, I feel better about my inner monologue. It's like, okay, I'm trying, but nobody would have to know how many people reject it. And it, even if it gets rejected, it never becomes a traditionally published book or whatever. You know, I could self-publish it if I wanted to and then just give it to my kids to give to their kids because by, by this time my kids were in college. And I decided I was going to be brave for myself. Why not? Because I had nothing to lose because nobody knew. It was just all, it was all my, my own little secret. So actually when I did get published or I did get the contract and, or the call from the publisher and then the contract, it, it was like my family said, uh, okay, you're doing what now? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, wait, wait, what, what are you doing? And then, um, so each step I do, oh, you're, wait, you're, you're going to New York to do what? And I'm like, well, uh, yeah, c you know, Connor, can you help me out? You know, can you help me with the signing? And he goes like, wait, wait, you have to stop. Like, what are you doing? Another <laughs> Another level was when I had the app created, the Pika Bunny Kindness Tracker. It's like, wait, do that. Like, wait, just stop, mom. What are you doing? <laughs> so I have to point out um, the irony here that you were a closet writer and you're doing this interview from your closet. Okay. Well, all the best for you, Louise. It's <laughs> only the so best. Is this going to be another example of your kids saying, you did what? You did what, mom? But seriously, I couldn't help but comment on that. There is a, sub the, maybe subconsciously there is something there. Maybe. Maybe I do my best work in here. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll um, just stay in here. Yeah. So, so I want to rewind the clock a little bit more, even from before you wrote that first manuscript. Um, Rewinding the clock to when you were a little girl yourself. So what did little Wendy want to do when she grew up? Oh, little Wendy loved all the fantasy jobs. Like okay. um, be um, an airline a, a flight attendant. <laughs> <laughs> like the glory, you know, go all over the world. Um, be a ballerina or a dance teacher, which I did get to do. I got to check that. Um, I wanted to be an inventor got to check on that have a patent and then I wanted to um I wanted to write stories but I didn't I didn't really think I was going to be able to write stories it was but I wanted to be a dancer first and that's what I did first with my career and it taught me so much it taught me about how, um discipline and how much time is required for each little part and how to, how to work as a team and I learned how to choreograph my stories through dance. So I did actually write my manuscripts, but I was really putting my stories out in public and out there dance. So that's how I started with performance and choreography. 
It's not amazing. And I, I, I find people's stories so interesting, especially when, when, when you can look back and start to connect the dots and how yes. your unique experiences come together to tell such a unique story. It was one thing to say that I'm a published author. That in and of itself is a is like massive credit to, to you, but uh, and to anyone who is a published author, the work and discipline that's required to put that together. But the how it comes together, that is just such a neat thing. Like to use your gifts in 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 dance and choreography and creativity that way to to develop your story, I think is 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 so inspiring. Um, inspiring as well for listeners to be able to understand that they too can do that. That when you look back for the purpose of seeing how your life can uniquely knit together um, or, you, or you can thread together the unique experiences of your life into something really, really different, you know, can give you a unique value proposition if you want to use marketing terms, but just really be able to shine in your own uniqueness. I love all of what you shared. Um, I was a dancer as well, but I didn't, I mean, I'm talking like I was not a dance instructor. I just danced a lot as a, as a kid. And uh, I actually still have my dance shoes hanging in my mirror, oh, on my mirror, in my bedroom. Oh, you do, that's I, exciting. I do, I've got my point shoes hanging there because those t remind me of, of really, uh, really meaningful times. Um, so the invention piece, is this the app? Or oh, tell me more about this invent. Okay, well, what? <laughs> Who said? I was serious. Tell us about this invention. Well, my husband, he started calling me in the nineties. He started calling me a Renaissance woman, and I didn't, I didn't really understand. Like, what do you mean by that? What do? You and he just would laugh, and, and say, "Yo, okay." So this goes all the way back to when I was three I believe um, the story starts when my mom my mom and my mom yeah, sorry my mom and dad divorced when I was two my mom and I moved in with her parents and then my mom took me on vacation to visit one of her sisters and she um, put me down for a nap and as soon as she shut the door I thought to myself oh I know there's candy in my mom's suitcase I remember, I remember this like as yesterday, mm -hmm. climb off the bed, I open the bottle, I eat 80 baby aspirin. Yes. It played on the floor and then I heard uh, like a few hours later, my mom came back and I hopped back in bed like, you know, I was sleeping, but the empty bottle was on the floor and she's asking me, Wendy, what, what is this? And I said, she said, where's the baby aspirin? I didn't know what she's talking about. I'm like, oh, I ate the candy. She's like, no, where is it? I ate the candy. I remember being at the, in the hospital, two people in white coats saying, where, you know, what happened? I said, I ate the candy. Like, <laughs> sorry, it's gone. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> sorry, none for you. I ate it all. And I remember somebody squeezing my mouth and breathing them breathing my um, breath and they said oh my gosh smell that and then I remember carts coming in I remember them laying me back and then I remember them putting something in my throat and then I then I remember waking up really really mad in a crib <laughs> we were super angry so because of that then then we're going to fast forward to when um, my daughter was little toddler she would always get ear infections and we would get the antibiotic and we put it in the fridge, but she could always, even though I had like a, one of those little snap locks on the fridge, she could always figure out how to open it up. And I could keep catching her trying to chug this medicine. <laughs> so I go to Toys R Us when there was a Toys R Us back then. I go to all the stores. I need a pharmaceutical lock box. And they're like, Oh, what? I'm like, I need a medicine box. And they said, uh, well, what you do, you go to Walmart and you get a case. And I said, no, no, no. I want a medicine box where I can store my things upright. And he said, you get a cash box at Walgreens, one of those metal ones. And I thought that can't be a thing. <laughs> I researched it. There wasn't anything. So in 1997, um, 
I got with a group of friends and we developed a pharmaceutical lockbox that's portable, but it was way before its time. So when, when companies like, um, like the safety companies, I forgot which one it's called. Safety first, I think it's called. Well, they oh, were looking yeah. at it, but then they said, well, there's no need for it. They, they said there's at the time, you know, there's no need for it. And, and we were like, well, this, you can lock up medications that you don't want your kids to get into. But, well, then that was before the epidemic of, you know, the pharmaceutical problem we have today. Yeah. And then um, they said, well, there aren't that many kids who get poisoned for overdoses. And it just never, never got off. And plus the tooling with it was like $140,000 to get a, a mock-up where now, you know, they can do the 3D printing and it's, you know, much more affordable to be able to, there was, you know, no shark tank or anything. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I was, I was a little before my time too bad because I think now that we have all the, um, the geriatrics and people with um, memory issues who, you know, may or may not remember if they took their medicines in the morning, this had a little drop drop down section where you could write a caregiver could write with the grease pencil like what time the medications were given and all that and it was a travel size it would fit in the door of your fridge it was just it was that is really beautiful but it was before it's time yeah and so what happened so so before it's time has someone else come up with something like this then or what has happened well um i think the patent has been um listed in other people's patents Okay. But they have, nobody's actually made, see the patent expired. Yeah. Nobody's made the exact one, but they've made some of them, but I could see a lot of flaws. Some of them were made out of canvas. You know, that's, so that's easy to, to get into if somebody wants to get into it. This was made from really, really hard plastic where you would have to take a sledgehammer to it. Yeah. Um, it could be put in the dishwasher. A lot of the boxes out there today can't be in the dishwasher or they're too big or... Um, I did see though, I can't find pictures of it now, so I can't prove it now, but I did keep looking to see if anybody took the design and, you know, made it their own because it was expired. I did see where the U.S. military did actually have, like they took it and they made it bigger, like a locker size, because it has a special, um, it has a very special lock mechanism. How so, cool is that? Yeah, so I'm like, oh, that's right. I wanted to use your design. <laughs> well, you know, they get to for free. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, no. Anyway, no. so I just, I came up with it because if I could just save one life, if I could just prevent one, one kid who loves baby aspirin <laughs> <laughs> from taking, you know, 80 at a time, or it might, you know, somebody like my daughter who really loved her antibiotic and, yep. you know, didn't want to, you know, trying to prevent somebody from being poisoned, so. Um, what what I many things I took away from that story, but linked to your first manuscript, talk about another example of before your time. Uh, yes, right? <laughs> I'm a late bloomer, I guess. No, I think you're an early bloomer. Oh, you think? Oh, 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 right? maybe that's what my husband meant, meant by Renaissance woman. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You'd have to ask him. I'd be interested to know. <laughs> tell me. I, I keep asking him. He's like, "You're gonna figure it out one day. You'll be fine." <laughs> like okay when you okay. do let me know but i think that's actually kind of neat no that you've come up with two things no doubt more that have a far before their time so all of life's um obstacles thinking about you know the challenges that you've been through with some of the things that you've shared and, and many of the things which you haven't what's one of the biggest obstacles that you had to overcome and what what has it taught you Hmm. probably one of them was an emotional block maybe um like I said my parents divorced when I was two and I I only see my bi biological father very rarely like maybe once every seven or eight years for a couple hours and you know that is why I loved another reason why I loved Fred Rogers so much Mr. Rogers because he, he taught me to look at myself and accept myself. Whereas I'm like wondering why there's this hole, you know, in my family, why am I not important, but I'm important to Mr. Rogers. 
because I didn't I didn't realize that Mr. Rogers didn't really see me. <laughs> <laughs> of course he saw me, Louise. <laughs> he knew me and he loved me, okay? Aww. And he was telling me stories and that always stayed, you know, in my heart and that's why I like to tell stories or I did like to tell stories through dance and that's why I like to write my books is that you know, I want to talk to that kid who, you know, doesn't have everything like a lot of, you know, a lot of kids have everything. There's always a lack of something, mm. but, you know, maybe that kid's bucket is, doesn't even have a drop in it. I want to talk to that kid. I want to talk to all of the kids. Oh I want, I want all my tribe <laughs> around me. <laughs> oh my gosh. Just totally like got me right in the heart. That's like the loveliest loveliest thing i want to talk to all the kids like um and i'm and i'm and i'm sure you and i'm sure you do all those that you reach through your stories i don't suppose i'm totally putting you on the spot right now i don't suppose you have one of your books in your closet with you do you i do but do you have a question about it i wanted you like to read a little bit of it can you do that uh, of course i can Okay. <laughs> I would be glad to. I love it. Okay. So I don't, so when I go to a school or I, I'm a Microsoft educator. So when I read via Skype, which I have about 300,000 Skype miles now. So I've, I've read in 13 countries, I think. Wow. But I don't like to read the story. I like to tell you the story, which is okay. too bad that your listeners can't see my face. <laughs> uh, well, okay. they can. If so, they, go to you, they can go over to YouTube and they will see the video. Okay. Oh, gosh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> oh, great. Okay. Um, how, how much do you want me to read? Uh, just read your, fav read your favorite part. One of your favorite parts. Just go for it. And I'll, I'll, I'll cut you oh, off. If it's yeah, cut me, me off. I'll need to be cut off. Okay. Um, all right. So in each, let me give you some background about my writing. I love so it. So my favorite chapter book growing up was The Wind in the Willows. And this is a, I tell the kids, um, this is an old book because I'm old. <laughs> so I said, I'm not going to bring you a shiny new book and tell you I read this as a kid because that yeah. doesn't make sense. And they all laugh. Aww. And in each, because of The Wind in the Willows has a, um, main character of a toad or a frog he's a toad really i hide a secret frog Shh, she's a secret in each of my books and her name is anora hugmuck so if you see her you wink at me or you blink at me you ready ready because this is going to be an interactive reading and I'm okay gonna... all right pika bunny's yummiest chore was to rid the garden of the chamomile plants that crowded mama's garden Pika's nose got itchy and twitchy as a big question formed inside his little head. How do we love Mama? asked Pika. Well, love. Some say that love is kindness, and some say that love is understanding. Which one do you think it is? asked Pika as he crunched and munched. Well, love is how we act, not how we think, Mama. Giving is the happiest love can be. Peekabun didn't understand what Mama meant, but every time he said, I love you, she said, I love you, he felt wiggly and squiggly inside. Hop, 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 Pika hopped to the meadow. He loved to hop in the tall green grass. The grass was tickly and formed a tunnel where he and his friends played exciting games like hush and duck. Louise, why would a Pika Bunny play hush and duck? I don't know. Well, I think he was trying to practice to hide from predators. Well, Peekabani spotted a blank horse that reminded him of one of Mama's patchwork quilts. Snap, snap, snap. He picked three for Mama. The first was blue, like the smell of... Blueberries. All right. The second was pink, like the taste of... Lollipops. And the third was orange, like the feel of. Orange, like the feel of. Help what me out. What does orange feel like? Orange feels like fuzzy. There's no wrong answer. Okay. Fuzzy. Very good. 
<laughs> and they stood for his three favorite words for mama. I love you. Very good. On his peek of money, he spotted his prickly porcupine friend, Downy Poof Puff. No one wants to hug me because of my prickly porcupine quills, she said. Pika thought about the times he felt lonely. Loneliness is not a good feeling at all. Louise, what do you think Pika Bunny did? I think he gave her a hug. Well, he said. He said and put his arms in the widest circle he could form with his own two brave furry arms. He expected Downy to be bristly and pointy, but really she was spongy and a little squishy. Mm -hmm. And he gave her the blue flower, and that left her how many flowers for Mama? Two. That's right. You're so good at math. <laughs> at that time, the sun was high in the sky, and Pika and she looked fluked and plooped. What do you think fluked and plooped means? Flooped and plooped? Yeah, what do you think? They're made up words. What do you think that means? Well, I missed the first little bit of that sentence. So we're going to have to repeat that oh, sentence for me. Sure. The butterfly was hot. She'd been flying all day. And she says, I feel flooped and plooped. What do you think that means? I'm tired and hungry. Oh, very good. Very good. And what do you think Pika Bunny did? I think Pika Bunny helped. He did. He gave her the pink flower. Notice it was twice as big as Emma. And he said, you can rest in its shade. And that made her happy. And that left him how many flowers for Mama? One. Pika Bunny was almost home when he spotted old Daniel Elderberry snoozing and snoring in his rocking chair on his front porch. Some of his overly large teeth peeked out of his enormously black rubbery lips. And Pika thought, for being such a scary-looking bear, you know what? Old Danny was really gentle and kind. And today, he smelled like dandelion and huckleberry jelly sandwiches. Pika tucked that orange flower next to the bear. Oh, Daniel was going to be so happy when he woke up. Hop, hop, hop. Pika hopped home. He couldn't wait to give those three flowers to Mama. Mama wanted to know why she was feeling, he was feeling so sad. And he gave those three flowers, he wanted those three flowers to say the words, I love you. That's right. And he said, Mama, I gave each flower to one of my friends. And what do you think Mama said? I think Mama loved him even more for that. Well, she said, Pika, I'm proud of you for giving away those three flowers. And he said, I, I wanted to show you I know what love is. And she said, Pika, you did show what love is. And Pika thought and thought, love is an action that makes a happy feeling. And that wiggly and squiggly feeling inside of Pika grew even wigglier and squigglier. And then here's the last illustration, Louise. What do you think this means? And there's, no, there's no wrong answer. What do you think that illustration says? Oh, honestly, Wendy, I'd love to know what some of the kids tell you. <laughs> oh, it's really fun. Like mama gave him a flower or the flower was thirsty or um, old Daniel wanted another sandwich. It's really fun. So Aww. the illustrations for this one are, are by Adriana Allegretti. So, wow, you let me do the whole thing. I'm sorry. I sorry. Apologies and apologies. No, those who wanted to listen will, will have listened. And I think that um, <laughs> I, I, I loved it. I loved so much about it. Obviously the storyline, I loved hearing your performance right like that how again it's linking I just love the links to you being a dancer and a choreographer and how that's so part of who you are and how you're bringing that out in a different way now still also genuine and authentic to who you are and now through teaching kindness not dance but through kindness and still in, in, in this kind of way um, one of the things my mom has told me growing up, and I sort of, not sort of, I did turn my nose up at it when I was younger. Um, but since becoming an adult, whenever that happened, <laughs> uh, I, I understood what she meant. And that's kindness, she said, is the most underrated quality. 
And I think because I had so much love and kindness around me growing up, I was very, very fortunate. It didn't, I just thought that that was what, that's what normal was. And as I, you know, made my own path in the world and recognized that wasn't really the case, her words have really resonated with me over time. And so um, hearing you share that story just makes me feel, remind me of my, you know, my mom. And I think that uh, no doubt there'll be others who feel that way or feel a different way as a result of perhaps what they didn't have that your stories may be, um, may, may be helping them with. What is your hope for the stories that you've written? Well, my hope is that, I mean, I, I just want to help one child. And if I can help one child feel better or use their imagination or, or know that, you know, like, you know, my, my childhood was kind of sad. But my adult life is really, really the opposite. It's very, very happy. I was able to make good choices and and know what I knew what love was. I did have some. I did have love in my life, but I I wanted it deep, deeper and richer. And I just want to help kids. My mission statement is to help kids navigate a difficult world. And I just I just want to help kids. I did read outside of, of London and uh, let's see, it was Nailsworth Primary in October. I had the privilege of reading to um, grades one and two. Wow. And, you know, you hope they like the story. There were lots of smiles. There were hugs after. We made flaps out of tissue paper. Um, you know, I hoped that, you know, maybe one person heard the story. And it, it was important to them. And Last week, email from a friend of mine who coordinated this reading, and she sent pictures of a bunch of poster. And I was like, I hadn't even like woken up because I hadn't turned yet. I was just like, I got a notification that that she had uh, emailed me, and I was like, Oh, what is this? And what the school had done was they took the book and they created their own manuscript and they talked about empathy with each of the characters they even created spent the time to orchestrate their own music and they made a musical out of it they did and not yes I, I burst into tears i burst into tears so hard and fast that my dogs <laughs> jumped <laughs> off the bed and thought they were like what's wrong what's wrong because like I said, the not even on yet. And here I am like going, like just, I was just so, because I knew how much time that took because of my background. I knew, and I thought, oh my gosh, I wasn't even sure if they liked it. And then they turned it into this and, you know, I wish I could have seen it. I probably would have started burst out crying again. And then I would have frightened all the children and they would have thought I didn't like it when I was just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that. You know, this was so worth the wait. It was so, just for that, it was so worth the wait. I, I think that uh, it's a perfect example of we never truly know the full extent to which our, we, are, we are of service to others, do we? And so how beautiful that you got that kind of validation that you're having an impact. Because we don't always know. We just, can, we, we often hope we continue to put our work out there and what a rewarding way to hear how you touched them. I also know, I expect that there are many others that you're touching along the way, like the readers, the adults, and maybe older children who are reading these books to the younger children. I, you know, I, I hope so, but you know, I just, I just keep, I just, you know, I, I pray and if other people don't, like to pray that's fine that's just what I do and I just pray that you know I I speak to that person that was like me that just needs like needs the eye contact you know they're heard I always let like I make my readings interactive and I have a little hand signal that means me too mm -hmm. so when we're talking about when I'm reading Pika Bunny says Eep and that's a book about finding the courage to help a friend say no to bullying 
Mm. Um, you know, where you use the me too sign. So anytime they, I say something and they may be too shy to raise their hand, but they'll do this. They'll make the signal like really low and look at me like, yeah, me too, me too. And sometimes it's only three or four people that do it. And all of a, all of a sudden they'll be 25 doing it one, one time. And I know, okay, I'm, I know where to go with my talks depending on what they can relate to with what I'm saying. Wow. Do you think adults need more kindness? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think it grew out, it either grew out of us or maybe we had too many, some of us had too many negative experiences when we were trying to be nice or maybe we were misunderstood. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of like a, I was doing the bucket analogy. I think a lot of our buckets are, are pretty empty and it's hard to give when you don't have anything left to give. So sometimes just that smile does make a huge difference. Just a smile to somebody. And then when they actually tell you, the stranger actually says, thanks. That's the first smile I saw today. I was at a restaurant this weekend with a friend of mine and the waiter came up and he said, hi, how are you? And um, how are you doing? And I said, fine, how are you doing? And he stopped and he looked at me and he goes, I'm doing really well. Thanks for asking. And I, I didn't, I was like, what? why is anybody asking you that back? That's just, you know, common courtesy. That's not necessarily kindness, but it's like, he was really surprised. I actually asked him back. I, I, I see that every day as, as well. Um, over Christmas, um, I was in a store. Um, Jay and I were both in a store together. Jay, you know, Jay, my partner, Jay, yes. we were in a store and, you know, it's busy in the stores and it's stressful, no doubt, for the people who work in the caches. And so I asked the person who served us, I said, we're going to um, Starbucks to grab a coffee. What do you drink coffee or tea and what do you take in it? And he stopped and he's like, are you serious? So I'm only talking about getting him a cup of coffee or tea, okay? Yeah. And he ended up refusing a coffee or tea. But in that moment, just what he got from the fact that I paused and asked him for that, um, that was, uh, he felt really good for it. I felt just, it was just a whole lot of feel good hormones being shared after you <laughs> do that simple question, right? That simple act of, connection yeah it, it um, can make a difference for somebody especially if they hadn't had any kindness um for a while yeah i also wanted to give a shout out to to a book that was really meaningful to me um you keep you've mentioned a few times how full is your bucket there's a book that um i'm going to show it on uh on the video so those watching youtube can see it how full is your bucket um, by, it's for kids by Tom Rath. Um, I came across this book. I can't remember how many years ago now. I want to say 12 years ago. No, 10 years ago. <clears throat> and uh, it was actually when I first went to see a therapist when I was having quite a difficult time in my life. And I bought that book and give that book even to adults. And so that's partly why I say to you that I know that your stories and your books will be having an impact on a population far beyond that those you've written the book for. And um, I've never in, informed the author of the impact he's had on me in my life, but you've kind of inspired me actually to um, to share, I'll find out what his email is and I'm gonna send him a message because it has had deep and lasting impacts in terms of how I started to um, find my own way back to me. So yeah, I just, that would mean that, that would probably mean the world to him. I will do that. Yeah. Another way to- he Probably I, wrote it just for you. Oh uh, yeah. That one person, you could have been that one person. Right, that's mm -hmm. what it felt like. And that's, right. that's what it felt like. Right. Um, so you've done many scary things, no doubt, in your life, some of which you've shared. If you have to say, you know, the, the scariest thing that you've done in your life, what, what would it be? To have children. <laughs> <laughs> to have my own kids. I yeah. didn't know what I was getting into. I love it. I love it. It's like one of my favorite parts. 
of my life, but boy, was it scary. <laughs> like, okay, like I had been babysitting. I had taught other kids, people's children dance. I'd been around kids all my life. And then when my, my son was first and in my arms, I thought, oh my gosh, what have I done? <laughs> I hope I don't mess this up. I hear you. And there's no return. There's no return policy. I think when as scary as it is, is usually balanced by how rewarding it is. Yeah. Yeah. And I would liken that. I imagine that's how you must feel at this point with your books. It's yes. scary. The journey was long, just like being a mother is right. long and rewarding and hard and wonderful and everything in between. Um, what's one piece of advice you would give to listeners about overcoming fear as you have had to overcome in putting yourself back out there again and bringing your manuscript out of the trash? What, you know, you had to overcome fear numerous times, no doubt, never throwing it out, despite it being in your hands numerous times, and then overcoming the fear of rejection again. What, 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 what advice would you have for others? Well, I had to know the why. Why do I want to do this? Mm. And getting those manuscripts out there was because I didn't like that inner dialogue that I was telling myself. And it wasn't matching up with what I believed in and what I was telling my kids to do, live their fullest lives they can, um, make sure you're happy with what you, what you do um, for a living. And... I had to know my why and my why I now have a, I now have a mission statement, which I said was helping children navigate a difficult world and anything that fits under that umbrella is, you know, I'm welcoming a lot more. Like um, I have an app, a free educational app, the peak of any kindness tracker. And that came because I was reading via Skype to a classroom and a little boy who was wearing a t-shirt that said, kindness is cool. I guess he didn't realize that the reading hadn't started yet. And I guess he didn't realize I wasn't a TV show. <laughs> I was alive. It was a live reading. And he was picking on the kid next to him. I can't say he was bullying the kid because bullying, you know, is an act that, you know, somebody does over and over to make you feel bad. But he certainly wasn't being kind to the kid next to him. And I just said, oh, you on the second row in the blue shirt, what does your shirt say? And he goes, oh, my shirt says kindness is cool. And he didn't get the irony, but I did. Right. I was like, okay. And I thought, <laughs> how many times a day am I really kind? And then I started tracking where I was kind. And I thought, oh, wouldn't it be kind of interesting to have an app where kids can track their areas of kindness and see how kind they are at school versus how kind they are at home versus how kind they are to the planet. And then I, I just said, okay, nobody has to know I'm making this app. <laughs> so once again, <laughs> no, it's all secret. It's all in the closet, Louise, it's in the closet. <laughs> so like I said, my whole family is like, So I just beta testing and I beta tested it all myself. And it, each of the areas, you can see how many points you have in each of the areas. And I'll tell on myself that home did not, not score as many as things like recycling, planting seeds, um, saying hello, good, uh, you know, helping a teacher, helping a librarian. It wasn't that I was being mean at home. And it wasn't that I was being unkind at home. But I realized I wasn't saying things like good morning. Something simple with a smile, like good morning. Um, as often, I didn't give as many hugs as I could have. It was just like things got so on business, like, okay, this is what we're doing today. Blah, blah, blah. And I thought, oh, this is a good barometer of where I need, where I'm doing well and where I need to do better. Even though it was a kid's app. A lot of um, adults like it because they will, instead of school, they'll just put in work and it's been really fun. So your listeners, after they, after they finish the podcast, I hope they go download it because it's free. 
I love it. So that'll be in the show notes, listeners. As always, I will include um, the, a link to, to the app, information about Wendy, uh, Wendy's website, which is what, Wendy? WendyGilhula.com. W-E-N-D-Y-G-I-L-H-U-L-A.com. Uh, Gilhula, there we go. There, there's that awesome name again. And yes, get the spelling. Don't, don't, don't try to capture that while you're driving. Uh, get that. Right show notes, please. Um, I'm, I have one last, I think it's my last question. I have so many questions, but okay. I'm, I'm curious about how, how we can apply what you've learned about kindness to leadership. Do you want, this is what I ask myself, do I want a career or do I want a legacy? Do I want to be known as the best blank in the career? Or do I want to be known as, like when I go to my retirement home, Louise, I, I don't want anything left on the table if I can help it. I don't want any regrets. I, I want to have crazy stories. <laughs> like, oh yeah, I used to choreograph dance. I'll really prove it with your walker. Like, no, I can't break down <laughs> with my walker. But, you know, I, I, I want to have... I want to, I don't want anything left. I want to, I want to be, and I, I don't mean like career. I just mean like, I want to be as kind as I can. I want to leave, leave a legacy and example for my own children. Like, well, okay, well, mom was kind of crazy with the books and app stuff, but boy, she was brave. And in this time of my life, you know, I want to be more brave and maybe they will do it because I did it. And so what do you have in 2020 that's brave? What do you have planned that's going to take some courage? Well, I'm practicing courage right now because I have my first manuscript for a chapter book series for grades, um, pretty much like advanced readers for grade one up to grade three. So I'm looking for an agent for that. And I'm looking for an agent for my screenplays for a TV series, a possible TV series. So I'm just putting it out there that I'm being really brave by saying that right now. I'm telling you it's, <laughs> out, of the a lot. it's out of the closet. It's out of, yeah, it is out of the closet. Of the Finally. Closet. I mean, that's and, been my dream. So, and we'll so, and so if there is someone listening who thinks they may have a connection for you, how is it best to reach you? Um, my website has got my email address. It's really simple. It's just gilhula at gmail.com. It's not okay. Or let's, LinkedIn. LinkedIn's always great where we met. Go LinkedIn, all those con uh, connection points to for Wendy will be in the show notes, like I said. And let's pull together, friends, anyone who has any connections at all that may support Wendy in further pursuing her brave, bold dreams. Let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. Let's be kind and extend kindness to Wendy as she is sharing kindness through her words and her work with children and all the teachers and therapists and parents who have the joy of reading those words. Wendy, thank you so very much for sharing all of what you do every, every day and sharing your time with me today. I, I loved your story. I loved every moment that I, I got to hear you share that. And of course, just thank you for carving time out of your day to spend with me today. Well, you've been a blessing to me. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And of course, thanks to all of you, my loyal listeners. And I'll remind you that information about my radio show, my guests can be found at louisehreed.com. Also a big shout out to my producer, Cameron Steele at Contact Talk Radio Network and lots of love and kindness as always being shared to my one and only Jay Andrews. So until next Tuesday at 11 a.m. Eastern, I'm Louise H. Reed with two things for you today. I am challenging you to ask yourself, what do you want your legacy to be? And of course, encouraging all of you to have a bold and courageous day. Goodbye, my friends. Bye-bye.